All right, Brad, we are back. Players are still locked out. <laughs> we were hoping that we would come back and things would be happily ever after, but no, yeah, not the case. That we would have come back. We would have traded for Scherzer. We <laughs> traded for all kinds of no <laughs> <laughs> these are all pipe dreams these are all christmas wishes garrett i know yeah i know i know but it is a season and we are going to talk a little bit about holiday gifts for yeah. uh, giants fans here nice. now I, I you know what i realized is is when you sent me the two photos that you sent me which we'll share mm -hmm. in a little bit here is when i asked brad i sent brad a note and i said you know send me um, an idea of something you would gift for a Giants fan. And what I realized is what I meant versus what he interpreted <laughs> was a little off. But at the same time, it's because he is such a Christmas spirited person. He actually made it even more Christmassy than I originally wanted. So what we're going to do. <laughs> so Sweet. First, first, we're going to we're going to talk about prospects because Melissa Lockhart from The Athletic put her list of 30 top Giants prospects. We're going to go through all of them and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, Giants fans. If, you know, if you have a Giants fan in your life and you were going to buy him a Christmas present, like what would you send them? So Brad literally took that. What is in my <laughs> household that I would yes. gift them? And what's actually kind of interesting is, uh, you know, it's it's very thoughtful, especially and one of them is like a, a little bit of like a tchotchke um, that he has that I also have too somewhere in my house. So we'll talk about that. But I, I do have some things that people could physically buy if they want. If they couldn't go to Brad's house and steal it <laughs> out of his house, you could. I would. I was given from the heart. Yes. I was like, well, if if I had something, and I was like, this is. This is some of my most prized possessions. If somebody gave me these, <laughs> I would freak out. Yes. I, I already own them, but yes, I'm just yes. saying other people. Yeah. The other thing is, is I'm wearing my, you guys see my Warriors hat, because Steph Curry just broke uh, Reggie Miller's record for, or I'm sorry, Ray Allen's record for three-pointers in NBA history. Just mm. happened today, so I was watching the game. I That's crazy. had to represent my guy. Uh, okay, so. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, before. Actually, you know what? Before we get there, let, why don't we hit the intro? We're going to come back. We'll talk about what we're drinking. And then we'll head into the, everything else going on in the show. Spadrosian throws to Sandberg and the pitch is grounded to second base. Thompson has it. Throws to first. It's over. 27 years of waiting have come to an end. The Giants have won the pennant. So last week I talked about the Terramana on Yeho that I picked up. Now, what's interesting about this is it is more of like, um, I, I guess technically it's it comes from like a bourbon barrel or something. Mm. Is, is that the difference yeah. in the tequila? I believe so. I think it's an oak barrel of some sort, usually in Añejo. So gives it, uh, you know, kind of seeps out that brownish color and yes. gives it a little more of an oaky type of flavor. Yeah. So when I first sipped it, um, when I first got it, I will admit the the flavor was definitely stronger than your normal tequila, the silver or the gold. Like the silver is actually, you you can actually just put an ice cube in, and sip the silver and be totally fine. This was a little bit stronger, so I had to get used to the taste. Um, I did add a little bit of water and I added a little bit of, uh, of juice, lime juice in it. So I I'm now used to the taste, but it did take me a little while because of that, that strong flavor that, that it has that I was not used to from other tequilas that I was drinking. Yeah. It'll, um, the Añejos will kind of punch you in the mouth a little bit, um, speed bag, but you get used to it. And, um, and then by the time your mouth is numb. <laughs> it's really good yeah yeah no i i really liked it all right what about you i um <clears throat> so we talked about on the show last week denise was at um at uh trader joe's and doing some beer shopping and going through the beer aisles one of the ones she picked up for me she was going to get it anyways i said get that and she goes i'm not i was already in my basket <laughs> um she knows me well this is a revision brewing company out of sparks nevada which is right here they're starting to make a splash all over the country this is the tahoe haze now i always say if you take a a hazy ale 
and you slap the name Tahoe or anything having to do with the area that I live in, I'm going to buy it. And um, but revision always does. I mean, I, they rarely do anything that I've tasted and gone like, mm, you know, I could go either way. Almost everything I've ever had from them has been a winner, uh, top notch. That's why they're starting to kind of blow up all over the country. But uh, it's a nice, hazy Northeastern IPA, around 7% alcohol, uh, 16 ounce cans. I love those because 12 ounces sometimes is just not enough. And two beers at 24 <laughs> ounces sometimes is a bit too much. So I like the 16 ounce pints. There you um, go. Funny story about pints. So do you know how many ounces are in a pint? Um, no, no. Okay. So I know this because I drink beer. So it's one of those things you just know in a pint, you have 16 ounces. Okay. So that's what the 16 ounce can is. So when you go to a restaurant or a bar or whatever you would say, I'll have a pint of whatever it is. So Denise and I went to a, a Mexican restaurant in the area here in Reno. Um, and I said, and again, it's not a bar. It's not a beer joint. It's a Mexican restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I ordered the Dos Equis Amber. And I said, I'll just have a pint because usually when you go to restaurants around here, if you say, I'll have a beer, they'll give you the 22 or 24 ounce beer. They won't even ask. You oh, don't wow. get the 16 ounce pint. They'll bring you out the 22 or 24 and go, you wanted a beer. Here's a beer. Um, so the guy came out and, and he goes, came out with a gigantic mug of beer and he goes this is the 24 ounce i didn't know what a pint was i asked everybody in the back what a pint was by the time we figured it out we'd already poured the 24 ounce beer for you so i'm only charging you for a pint here's 24 ounces of beer so i i, I drank it all well what <laughs> what else gets measured in a pint uh, you know, you've got, um, when you're talking about like, uh, recipes and stuff, sometimes you'll have a pint of this or pint of that, uh, pint of blood is the only other one that I mm. really know of. When yeah. You're there giving you go. Blood, you give a pint of blood. Right, right, it's right. 16 ounces. Um, but yeah, there's not a whole lot else. So I've just kind of gotten the habit when I go and mostly we go to breweries. So when I say I'll have a pint of whatever they bring out, you know, a regular pint glass and you've seen them before just yeah. your regular pint glass yes and those are not actually for necessarily they weren't made for drinking beer but now they that's what they are used for they were originally made to make mixed drinks so you take your shaker and instead of putting that funny lid on it with the little hat on the metal shakers they would take <clears throat> and i think they're called um like bar back glasses they would just put those in there and shake them. And that's what they would use, pour it out and then strain it from there. Um, and they weren't, they weren't originally, uh, pint glasses, beer glasses, but mm -hmm. now they are. And that's what everybody uses to drink out of. I like the funky glasses. So, um, because you know, a little bit bigger, the tulip shaped, get a little bit more of the, um, effervescence and everything coming out of the beers. And that's what these are made for. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, long drawn out story about 16 ounces of beer. Good lesson there. <laughs> um, okay, so um, there's one other question I was going to ask you because, and in the Giants fan gifts that we're going to talk about in a little mm -hmm. bit, you cannot pass any gift list Amazon page without beer koozies. Yeah, and, and I, I think I've asked you about this before, and I don't think yeah. you said you were a beer koozie guy. I am when I'm camping. <clears throat> when I'm camping, love the beer koozies. As a matter of fact, Denise was cleaning out the kitchen the other day, came across three bottle koozies, the old ones with the like zip ups. They're mm -hmm. like half zip sweaters, you know, on the little beer bottle koozies. So I kept one of them as a Rams one. It actually looks like a jersey. It's got sleeves that stick out. It's <laughs> kind of goofy looking, but, but I love it. It's fun. Um, and then the other one uh, is just like a zip up from Billy Bob's in Texas, which is a very, very famous uh, country music bar that Willie Nelson, uh, Merle Haggard, all those guys mm -hmm. made very famous back in the 60s and 70s. Um, so I kept those two. And I, and I like them when I'm out barbecuing. I don't like to bring glass out there because I'm on pavers or I'm on cement or I'm on rocks. So I like to throw the cans in a koozie. Now, these guys, the 16s, they don't fit. 
Yeah. So you put the koozie and you're like that. So you got to drink that fast. And then, <laughs> and then you got that much left that stays cool. But the really nice koozies I like are made by Igloo and they're metal. And I always drink um, Zevia sodas out of those. Mm. And they don't make your hand cold and they will keep that Zevia soda cold for hours. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. So when we go to the beach, we'll bring those with us. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's talk about some prospects. Now, as we were talking about, the news is pretty light these days. Not mm -hmm. only is it the off season, not only are we in December, spring training is not going to start for another three months. We are in a lockout. So there's nothing of nothing going on. But thanks to great uh, places like The Athletic, they, they're still posting Giants content. Uh, Melissa Lockhart today posted her top 30 Giants prospects. So we're going to break down the top 10, though. I wanted to just kind of bring up some of the outside of the top 10 folks, just because I think that they're super interesting. So the Giants protected uh, in the rule five draft. They protected a kid by the name of Randy Rodriguez over someone named, uh, you know, people, more people know who Seth Corey is over, Randy Rodriguez and they protected Rodriguez and Corey could still be drafted. I they have not done the major league rule five draft yet. They right. did the minor league one, but um, this guy pitched in San Jose. The reason why he's interesting is because he comes in at number 30 on her list, but Zadie said that he may consider moving Rodriguez into the starting rotation because of the skill set that he has which is probably the reason why they decided to protect him. Um, and I just thought that was interesting because, you know, we've been talking about this forever and, you know, maybe to a fault, Zadie believes that he can find guys who are going to give uh, big time innings for, for the, the season. And, you know, you talked about this, you know, we're not trying to get a starting five as much as we're trying to get, X number of innings out of starting pitchers. So this is another guy who could possibly be on that list in the near future, though he is 22, has not pitched above, I believe, San Jose yet. Randy Rodriguez. Yeah, I don't see him above a ball. Uh, OK, so um, at 29, uh, Gregory Santos, who did play a few innings in the bigs this year, I believe he had at least one call up. Um, otherwise it's sort of disappointing, uh, season, but he, he's number 29. Uh, some of these San Jose guys are funny because I'm like, Oh, I know who that is. And it was because I went to two San Jose giants games this year. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, so, like yeah. there's a good, there's a middle infielder by the name of Jimmy Glowinky, who uh -huh. I, he's just a little guy. And he was just kind of like the spark plug. He, I didn't think he was going to be on this. So he's at number 28, uh, Carson Ragsdale, who we got in the trade for Sam Coonrod. Um, finished second in minor leagues in all strikeouts. You've brought him up before. Yeah. Uh, he's at 27. Uh, we'll scroll up here a little bit quicker. Uh, Prelander Baroa, who I also, he, I didn't actually see him, but I know that he pitched for San Jose, uh, struck out 135 in 98 innings. Um, Camilo Duvall, our good friend Camilo Duvall, who, uh, he was the, the closer by the end of the year for us. Yeah. He's still only 24 years of age. Um, he is at number 23. And I and I guess at some point, what is it? After the age of 25, you're no longer a prospect or you're like you, you've you pitched in the big leagues. Like, how does this work? Because he's... He He's our he's our closer and he's still on this list. Yeah, I think I mean you can still call somebody a prospect. I don't know if there's even an age limit, <clears throat> but I do know that once you are in the bigs for a certain amount of time, certain amount of A B, certain amount of innings pitched, that designation kind of goes away. Uh Duvall, I mean that this is interesting with him at number 23. It, she even says in here, you know, he's going to be the Giants closer for the next couple of years. And I think, well, I mean, he he's probably going to I would imagine open the season as the Giants yeah. closer next year, um, unless he has a a complete blow up in spring training, which I I don't really see. I mean, we've seen the ice in the veins, we've seen the just you know that no pressure. Yes, he gave up a knock uh, to the Dodgers in in the ninth inning, 
um, in the uh, game five of the NLDS, but still that's not, I mean, you know, that's no knock against the guy really. He's still earlier in the playoffs, just, just looked lights out and, and down this stretch was just awesome. So um, that's a tough one. That's, that's a strange one at 23. Um, but yeah, he, he won't have that des- designation, you know, after being a, a month in the bigs next year as the giants closer. Yeah. Um, and then as we get further down the list, we get to number 21. And I want to share his photo here for the people who are <laughs> watching uh, watching on the video podcast. And his name is a Swervin Kerwin. <laughs> is it? How, is it? It's a, you know, it's actually Kerveen. Kerveen. Yeah. Swervin Kerveen Castro. <laughs> uh, we, we saw him a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, he pitched in triple a uh and, and did very well and it looks like they're going to try and stretch him out to be a starter he throws in the high 90s so he may be another one of these guys who zadie turns to you know when you know when we need some starting pitching help but uh, melissa has him at number 21 and then we go further up um and there's another person before the top 10. Oh, here we go. Will Wilson. You remember Will Wilson because uh, the Giants traded for Zach Cozart's bad contract. He's no longer <laughs> yeah. just Zach Cozart. You, the bad contract <laughs> has to follow his last name because that's why they traded for him. Uh, and, and so they got the Will Wilson got tacked on to that deal. So that the Giants took the contract. And yet he hasn't really had a good offensive season. He did hit 15 bombs last year in high A and double A, but still hit for a low average. Um, Very interesting to see if they actually get something out of him. I kind of feel like he'll be someone who they could plug in defensively, but I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll be surprised if he hits enough to play in the big leagues, but, but he's just someone who we keep an eye on just because of that trade. Like we we'll, we'll always know who the Giants gained in the picking up the Zach Cozart contract. Yeah, for sure. And I think and I'm going to date myself here, but I think I would like to start calling him Will Flip Wilson. Can we <laughs> can can we do that? Uh, comedian Flip Wilson. Our, you and I are probably the only ones who know who Flip Wilson is. But <laughs> <laughs> That's because we're old. Famous comedian in the 60s and 70s, kids. Go check him out. He was hilarious. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm i going to really um, latch on to this kid if he can make it to the bigs and be everything uh, they say he's going to be. And mainly because we are desperate for a second baseman at this point. <laughs> it's yeah. been a long time since we've had a really solid second baseman that we can count on. I mean, Donnie Barrels did a fantastic job, but it was one of those kind of, you know, the curve on his career was kind of wow. And then back down to kind of middle road now. So, you know, I think us Giants fans are just dying for a super solid second baseman who can come in and, and be there for a few years. Yeah. I mean, the one thing he does do is, is he, he does hit for a little bit of power and he can, mm. he can run a little bit. So, you know, middle infielders are valuable, especially with all the switching and moving guys around that uh, that the Giants do. If he could, if he could play both positions up the middle, that that's a, it's a valuable valuable person. Oh yeah, uh, Sean Jelly, number fifteen here. He is um, somebody who I think that we all think possibly make the big squad in twenty twenty two. Maybe one of those guys who gets those those uh one uh, a handful of those starts maybe and I, I think the the worry about him is really it doesn't sound like he's gonna be a wipeout strikeout guy he's going to have control he's gonna get ground balls he's gonna try and keep the ball out of the air um and you know with his release point because he is so tall at what is he like 611 that that should create some some advantages for him, especially you know maybe when those shadows are out there yeah. in Dodger Stadium on a five <laughs> o'clock game on Fox. Uh, but you know it'll yeah. be interesting to see what he does because I, I think 
I think in some instances, the expectation is he's just going to come in here and blow guys away. And I don't think that's the type of pitcher he is, but uh, I do want to see what he has. If he can give us six to maybe eight or nine quality starts this season, kind of filling in for guys, um, you know, again, they talk about getting 162 games out of their pitchers, not a five man rotation. Uh, Jelly is one of those guys. I mean, he'd give you six to eight to nine to 10 quality starts. Uh, throughout the season, uh, I'll take that. I mean, yeah, yeah, don't strike anybody out, whatever. Make contact, get through five innings, turn it over to the lights out bullpen. Yeah, it could be a, a, a solid starter for the Giants this year. Another guy, but we won't talk too much about him because there's not much about him, but Matt Mikulski, who was their second pick in this year's draft, just a name to kind of keep in the back of your mind. He is 22 left-hander. So because he is 22, he's probably going to, grow and, and a college pitcher is going to grow through the minors a little bit more quickly. Yeah. Um, and then at number 11 is, is one Seth Corey, who it's kind of interesting that he's, you know, Melissa has him so high, but they did not even protect him and they could possibly lose him in the rule five. Um, some of that is uh, possibly, I, I, I don't know, didn't didn't have the greatest year in uh in 2021 uh had some command issues you know went to high went to uh, eugene and and just did not pitch well so interesting that she has him so high and yet the giants did not protect him yeah and yeah you know again a 23 year old pitcher at this point still pitching down in a ball it's it's kind of that's always a tough one because you start to look at ages like that you look at you look at a 23 year old in a ball and you say well i mean maybe his prime is is past maybe his um you know prime prospect range has passed but i mean it, yeah she does have him up there pretty high i'd probably put him closer to like 15 16 on the mm -hmm. list looking at some of the other guys um but yeah it'd be interesting to see what happens with him this year all right, so let's break down the top 10 here. We have Averson Artiaga, who I I mean I've seen him on list, but I've I I you know I guess he is climbing the ranks here. Uh Dominican Academy. Uh he's you know sort of right in the in the mold of uh, the Luciano and and um, Amatos, those guys, shortstop. Arizona Rookie League, and then he was promoted to low A San Jose for the playoffs. You know, they have these guys who, because they're not drafted and because they're international signings, you don't really hear about him. But I feel like if he was drafted out of high school in the United States, like everyone would know who this guy was. But because of the international thing, uh, you know, baseball prospect folks, uh, know him, but I, I'm I'm now I'm way more interested to to learn more about him, and and he probably will start in San Jose, and he may be the guy that I go check out for a couple games this year. Yeah, that uh, single A club could actually be pretty loaded this year. Um, I might actually have to make it down this summer and catch some games with you. Yeah, that'd do, be fun. Do it do a show from down there or something, because I mean, yeah, looking at the list here and looking at who's going to be in single a at San Jose next year, it's going to be pretty stacked. All right. Hunter Bishop, who was the once uh, number one pick in uh, 19 or 2019. And he's been hurt. He has not been able to really play a whole lot of baseball of late. I think 2022 is going to be a big year for this guy. Um, he needs to stay healthy. He needs to produce. I know there's a little bit of worry from him. I've, I've heard him talk a little bit about saying, you know, it's 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 it was hard for him to come back and really be confident in his body and such. So I do wish, you know, we we know that you don't get drafted that highly uh, as as a as a bat by the Giants and just you, you know you're you're kind of like a, a disappointment. So there's something to this guy, but. He has not yet been able to show it, but he's like one of the most uh, he's one of those guys. Like, like when we were younger, there were so many 
uh, hitters that the Giants had in their farm system were like, oh, this year it's going to be, you know, Damon Miner. <laughs> and like <laughs> this year, you know, it's going to be whoever the next bat was. And they wouldn't, you know, Rickert Fanita. Like this yeah. guy's like never yeah. did anything. No. And, <laughs> you know, the Giants have had a little bit more success, obviously, with Crawford and Belt and uh and uh and the, you know the best one buster posey so you know the hopefully there's there's more guys coming through and hunter bishop could be one of those guys but it's just it's just too hard to say when he could not stay on the field well and that's the thing i just got finished saying that another 23 year old and seth Corey, you know see, being at single a it's you know it's kind of questionable at this point what his track is going to be but with hunter bishop same thing 23 never played above high a ball uh but it's because of all the injuries it's because of covid it's because of everything else kind of lined up um and and kind of knocked him down so yeah i mean i think everybody's kind of uh, giants fans are looking at hunter bishop this year and we're like man this is going to be a fun minor league season for him if he can stay healthy absolutely love to see what he could do he did fairly decent in the arizona fall league nothing fantastic but again um still getting his feet under him in the minors, but uh, a full season in 2022 in the minors is going to be exciting to watch. And if he gets up to triple a, um, I'll definitely be getting out to some aces games this year. And uh, any, anytime Sacramento comes up, be able to watch some of these guys. And number eight is someone who hot take Bry said would actually be <laughs> the replacement for Buster Posey over Joey Bart is yeah. Patrick Bailey. <laughs> Unfortunately for Bailey, because of the pandemic, he just hasn't played a lot of baseball. Like last year was the first, you know, time that he, that he played. He basically 2020 was uh, a bit of a write-off of a year and he struggled. They, they had him in, um, high a at Eugene. And the idea was he's going to play at Eugene. He's going to go to, uh, double A, but they'd actually drop him down to San Jose. And so I got to see him play a little bit. He hit a lot better at San Jose. The disappointment was in the fact that, you know, at high A, you know, a lot of college experienced players, which he was. But again, you know, he kind of comes out at a time where he did, he wasn't even able to finish his his college season. Right. So he yeah. hasn't played a whole lot of baseball in the last two years. So this year. He should get a shot. He'll probably be back in high A at some point and hopefully, you know, grow from there. But, uh, yeah, I would love to see this guy hit because we know that uh, defensively that uh, he's been he's been good. But it's just uh, the hitting was not great last year. Yeah. And I mean, could we see a Bart Bailey uh, a duo in the next couple of years? I mean, that's always a possibility, too. Um, does Bailey turn into the type of player that uh, Curtis Michael Casale is? And, uh, <laughs> you know, great catcher, great uh, defensive catcher. Um, <clears throat> it lacked a little bit of the hitting this year, but again, it took Casale a little while to get going because he was injured. Uh, but, you know, hey, it, it's not out of the question. We actually see a Bart Bailey combo in the future. Number seven is the guy who Melissa says may have uh, the best power ceiling in the minor system, Jairo Palmeris hit 20 jacks and 27 doubles in 302 a ball at bats. Um, uh, when he, he, he was, he hit 370 in San Jose and then he went to Eugene and dropped to 262. But yeah, I mean, he's a guy who, uh, probably not gonna, make the club as, as, as a defensive wizard, but because he can hit the ball out of the ballpark, uh, he's got a chance here. So I, I, I would imagine that, um, you know, the goal would also be to get him to double a at some point. He's only 21 though. So he's yeah. still young. Well, and we possibly have the DH coming. He's mm -hmm. a, he's another guy who's a prime candidate for that spot. So, yeah. And at number six, one of your favorites here, uh, Elio Ramos and you know he he did not hit terrifically in Sacramento um but I, I still think I would love to see him given a chance to you know play every day and play against that top level competition and then get a shot to play at the Giants but you know we've talked to a couple different people about prospects and you know, the, the, the giants prospects guy that we, that we talked to, 
he was a little lower on Ramos than most, so maybe that maybe he he knew something before others did. But uh, yeah, Ramos dropped to number six, and you know, just uh, probably two years ago, he was like number two on this list. Yeah. And then the Mississippi State uh, College World Series title winner Will Bednar, who I did get to see in his very first start, San Jose Giants. He is number five here, Giants top pick last year. Um, when he threw, because Melissa writes that a fastball could touch 97, we saw it sitting more 93, 94. So he was he was kind of cruising. He only threw, I think he only had through for two innings it was really just a just a little bit of a showcase uh for him but yeah it should uh it should, it should be interesting I, melissa thinks he'll start in high a so he won't be back with san jose so i won't get to see him but she said the hope is also that bednar will be up to double a by the end of 2022 well you also have to <clears throat> look at the fact that he's 21 years old um not a lot of experience uh, in the pros yet. Um, can can you consider twenty one year old nowadays as still a growing boy? Is that? I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, he can still put some muscle on him, put a little muscle on the legs, pump that fastball up two or three miles an hour. Because um, I mean, you know, it's still all the mechanics, all of the video cameras, everything else, all the analytics. Um, spin rate everything else it still comes down to you've got to have the power in your legs and, mm -hmm. and you got to have the right um rotation in your arm and everything else so i mean yeah yeah i, th I think he can still get up there and be consistently like 95 to 97 i don't think that's out of the question yeah six two two thirty. so it's big dude big dude yeah. Another big dude, Joey Bart. He is still at number four on this prospect list. See, it feels like Joey Bart's been on this prospect list forever. And he kind of has because he's the yeah. number two pick in 2018. He is now 25 years old. Uh, so last year, um, he, he, I guess I, I was always looking for power numbers from him because that's kind of what we're looking for. Yeah. And I think according to Melissa, they were really working on plate discipline, like laying off breaking balls outside the strike zone and inside fastballs that maybe even if he put wood on it, they wasn't going to be good swings. And um, but she says that his game calling and throwing are already assets defensively. So. You know, we always joke about the Johnny Cueto situation. Johnny Cueto's not on the Giants anymore. So <laughs> no. <laughs> Bart's got a clean slate with this club for 2021. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. He's, you know, if Bart doesn't make every headline in spring training, I, I don't know who will because you've got, you know, the face of the franchise, one of the greatest Giants players in the history of the Giants, and Buster Posey who just retired and you've got his replacement who's probably going to be playing in a hundred to 120, 130 games uh, behind the dish for the giants, unless something goes absolutely horribly wrong. What, what does he hit this year? Maybe two forty five with 20 home runs, 25 home runs. Um, and, and as long as he catches a good game, I'd take that. I'd take a 240 hitter with 20 home runs and, and catches a fantastic game at this point. Um, but yeah, he's, he's going to be in the headlines a lot, man. And, and, and like we talked about, is there an age uh, cap on a prospect? He's 25. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, if there was an age cap, I would have put it closer to like 24, 23, maybe, but yeah, 25 years old. Um, finally going to get his pretty much everyday shot with him and Kirk Casale back there. Um, it's going to be interesting. And again, if there's a DH, um, you know, and if you've got a, a left-hander on the mound and you got Joey Bart as, as your DH, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not hurting with that. I think things are going to look pretty good for this kid. He hit uh, 294 at Sacramento, 10 jacks, 46 RBI, uh, 358, 472 split there for uh, the on base and the power. My favorite prospect here, even more than Luciano. Uh, Luciano, uh, I mean, I, you know, he's 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 one of the best prospects in all of baseball. Yeah. So you know, we we can we can 
start popping our collar at Luciano, but not everyone knows about this kid, <laughs> Kyle Harrison at number three, lefty out of De La Salle, only 20 years old. This is all he did at San Jose, by the way. Uh, 98 in two thirds innings, 157 strikeouts. <laughs> Just dominating. That's sick. <laughs> Just fastball goes up to 97. Man. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, I can't wait to see this guy more. I, I, I don't think, um, he's probably, where did he end up? Did he end up in high a, or did he actually stay with San Jose for the whole year? Let me look that up. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but <clears throat> the, I mean, if you've got a lefty prospect, I mean, and, and the giants are, their organization is really, really built up. Zadie deserves a ton of credit. Um, They've really built up their minor league system to be an envy of, of a lot of the teams out there. And when you've got a left-handed starter in your top three prospects, um, things are looking good because left-handed starters are a very coveted commodity. Um, and so to have a guy like Kyle Harrison, because I was, you know, I wasn't complaining as much as most Giants fans were that, well, Zadie hasn't done anything. No, I think he did a lot. I think he was fantastic. You and I both agree. He did a great job in the off season so far with, you know, shoring up the pitching staff. And I'd say, I would keep thinking if we could get one more lefty, one, one more lefty starter and Kyle Harrison could be that after the all-star break, I, that's probably a little too early for him to come up in 2022, probably more like a 2023 type of guy. He's only 20 years old. Uh, 20 years old, sorry. But, you know, that left-handed pitcher that's so tantalizing, especially a left-handed pitcher that could strike out a lot of guys because left-handers are notorious for being the, uh, the you know, the goofy arm slot, the get you to pitch to contact, kind of slow ball you to death, but uh, not Kyle Harrison. And, and that's an exciting thing to look at. All right, number two prospect here on Melissa's list is Luis Matos. Uh, they, they, she said, uh, she wrote, there's an argument to be made that Matos is the best pure hitting prospect in the giant system. And it isn't a stretch to think he could eventually overtake Luciano as the organization's top prospect. That is actually mm -hmm. kind of interesting. So Matos was also in San Jose for the whole season, 313, 15 jacks, 21 stolen bases while playing center field. He only struck out, uh, 61 times and 451 at bats. So, Another guy to keep an eye on, and you know this this top three means, of course, number one. You saw him if you're watching the video. You saw him on the uh, the photo that started this podcast. Uh, Marco Luciano, he is uh, not only the Giants' top prospect, but he's like the one of the dandy prospects in in, in all of baseball here. Uh, the the I said I guess you could say the the negative thing is when the Giants promoted him to Eugene um he struggled and sh lots of strikeouts he hit for a low average and that was the opposite of what he did in San Jose like when I saw him in San Jose because we got to see him a couple times and like everything was just so easy like the swing and the effort like he could get to balls and it didn't even look like he was you know he had to try hard like just the athlete who he is just very graceful and um, everything looked like it came very naturally to him. So it was really cool to see him. And he is number one on the list there. And, and the giants top three prospects are all 20 years old. Um, so I, I know Luciano did have a little bit of those struggles last year when he, when he was promoted, but, you know, you got to remember as a Giants fan, he's 20 years old. He's going to have time. They're going to bring him along. It's confidence grows as you get older as well. And you see more and more pitchers, more and more pitches. Um, once you can start hitting the breaking ball consistently, then you, you start to build that confidence. Um, man, the Giants really do have a bright future. Um, they have a bright present right now as well. Um, but look at the top three prospects in the giants organization at 20 years old um and then and then number five will bednar i mean they just drafted him and, yep. and here he is in the top five already so that i mean the giants are just doing a, a fantastic job across the board this just sounds like a big like love fest right <laughs> i mean I, I can't find anything wrong with what's going on so far 
Um, other than, you know, we're, we're still not sure what's going on at the top club level because of the lockout, um, because the Giants didn't jump into the pool like everybody else did, which is fine, again, because there are going to be a ton of players still available when the lockout's over, and then we'll have an idea of what the price structure is going to be, salary structure across the board. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's an exciting time to be a Giants fan. This is not, you know – two or three years ago. This is, this is an, an exciting time. Just looking at this list gets me excited. Like I want to start the season. Let's go. I want to see minor league baseball. Mm-hmm. I might even start, um, you know, kind of subscribing to the minor league baseball uh, video portion on the minor league baseball website, just to kind of watch some of these games. Cause when the giants have an off game to be able to watch some of these games, be pretty fun. All right. Before we get to the gifts, the, the Christmas gifts for giants fans, I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, let's say Brandon Belt comes to you and says, "Hey, Brad. Um, in in, in my dreams, uh, you are the GM and not Farhan Zaidi." Yeah. And uh, I talked to Clayton Kershaw the other day. Kershaw would love to go back to the Dodgers, but the Dodgers are kind of playing hardball with them. They won't go higher than two for forty. He hmm. says, "If we go two for." 45 he'll pitch for us would you say yes or no to that question i just got finished saying that i would love to have another left-hander but two for 45 for a guy that most likely won't have more than 15 to 20 starts um are you, do you have his stats up? I, I'm just kind of curious when the last time he he had like 28 or more starts in a season. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it probably wasn't that long ago. I, you know, we we've kind of pinned Kershaw as a, a as an oft injured guy. He has been lately. Um, okay, so last year he had 22 mm-hmm. starts. Okay, year before he had 10. What that was the pandemic season. Year yeah. before that, 28. 26, 27, 21 in his uh, 2015 season, which was um, his, uh, what was his record here? He went 16 and seven uh, with a 2.13 ERA. He had 33 starts. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of put, I, I and the reason I say 28 starts is because I kind of put that on the upper end of durability. Uh, if you're going to, if you're going to sign a guy to 20 something million per year, I'd love to see 28 or more starts. Um, the giants, well, I'm the GM, so I'm not looking for <laughs> to, to spend that kind of money on a guy who's maybe going to give us like 15 to 20 starts. Um, so for that price, I'm going to say no, but if he wants to come to us on a show me one year, $20 million deal, I think I would do it. All right. So I'm looking at, um, the website spot, spot track, spot, Mm -hmm. spot, spot track. Spot Spo track. I always I always type in sport track. And <laughs> no. It always takes me to the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so I, what I'm trying to find out is what his market value is. So interestingly enough, Spot Track has him his annual average his average annual salary for his market value at thirty million, thirty one point eight. And they said the market value is three years, 95. So I I wonder why that differs from what it sounds like other teams are interested in him. Now, I'll give you a couple of different stats here. One that will tell you, oh, maybe he it it did a little bit better last year than I thought. And that is his strikeouts per nine. Mm -hmm. His strikeouts per nine were the third highest of his career 10.7 Ks per nine innings. The only time better was in 2015. I mentioned that year he was at 11, six 
And then uh, the year before that, when he won the Cy Young in the National League, he was at 10.8. So he's still striking out, guys. Now, the one thing that is a little bit different is he also gave up the third most hits per nine inning uh, of his career. Now, some of that is, you know, defense and positioning and stuff. And, and we could probably look deeper into that number. But only in uh, 2018, when he was at 7.8 and his rookie season, he was at 9.1. Did he have more than the 7.6 for last year? Um, and look, you know, this isn't the same Clayton Kershaw who was like, a 0.85 whip in his prime. No. But he's still really solid. His whip was 1.019 um and his FIP was uh 3. So his FIP uh showed better than his actual ERA. Uh, I'm I'm ju I'm just thinking I maybe I'm undervaluing him then. If he could, but but again, it's such a huge if. If yeah. he could go 28 or more starts the numbers he's had the last couple of years and the way he's still pitching he could probably still be a top eight Cy Young candidate mm -hmm. uh, I mean so so maybe I'm undervaluing him but I still can't see somebody looking at a three-year 90 million for him unless you're the Dodgers and and you've lost out on Scherzer and and, and you really want to keep your guy and and maybe that's where that number is coming from. They they have the money, they can spend the money on him. Um, again, we don't know what the landscape is going to look like in terms of salaries and you know uh, luxury tax hits and all that stuff once the dust settles from the lockout and the negotiations. But you know, so maybe I am undervaluing. I'll I'll, I'll up the offer, Garrett. You've sold me. I'll go one year. 24 million. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, so here's how Grant Brisby explained it. He said, okay, let's pretend that his name isn't Clay Clayton Kershaw. <laughs> it's Josh Smithy. <laughs> he didn't build a hall of fame career with the Dodgers, but with the Red Sox with whom he made eight all-star teams, won three Cy Youngs and won an MVP for various reasons. There's a chance, a small chance, but still a very real, real, real chance that the Red Sox, Red Sox don't resign him, re-sign him. He's still a future Hall of Famer. He's still the greatest pitcher of his generation, and he's still a 34-year-old with forearm elbow injury coming off his worst season since 2008. He still represents one of the Giants' best chances to get a top-tier pitcher with nothing but money, even if it would be a massive gamble. And so uh, Grant's verdict was kind of what you said. If the Giants felt confident that they could keep him healthy for 20 starts, uh, it's a great pairing. Um, but, you know, if, if the, the only way the Giants would probably get him is if they were so bullish on him because the Dodgers and then probably the Rangers have the first and then the the second best chances. Um I think the Giants would have to like really win the negotiation to to get him. But I think you know the Dodgers will probably Dodgers will probably get him back as long as they're competitive. I'm sure he wants to stay there. If the Giants are as conservative as other teams, they're they're not going to get him. They would have to be really bullish on him like having great seasons and paying him like he is going to have a great season. So. Oh yeah. Well, in perspective, Gossman is 31 years old, not oft injured and he's making 21 million this year. Uh, I mean, so you kind of have to look at that and say, I mean, is Kershaw worth 30 million this year? I, I, I wouldn't think so. I don't think anybody would give him that. So again, all right, you got me Garrett. A uh, one year, 25 million. <laughs> I've gone up another one, 25. That's my go. cap. There all you right. go. Right. Final offer, Clayton. I mean, uh, Smithy, Smithy, Josh <laughs> Smithy. All right. So um, now let's talk about our gift ideas for giants fans here we'll go with you first because again you know you were thinking very much <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking white elephant gift like i'm just gonna give away what i've got this is what but i have you, you have you have a specific gem here now we're gonna put this on the big screen here yeah oh, explain what this is to people who may not understand this kind of jacket that was 
really big when you and I were like teenagers. Yeah. So I worked at a store in, and I'm going to throw out some old names here. I worked at a store in Cupertino called in, at the Valco Mall. It's Valco. Is that still a thing? Is Valco still alive? Valco is open, but there's not a lot of stores there. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I used to go there and, and buy my singles of, um, all the Bobby Brown hits, my prerogative <laughs> when that came out, I'd go to music land, <laughs> but I worked at a store there called sports stuff. Um, and this is a parka. So in the eighties, um, starter used to make, you know, the starter jackets. Those are famous. Everybody knows the starter jackets. They also made parkas. Um, do you have the picture of the back of that too, that I sent you? Uh, you know what? I did not snag that. No, it's photo. no big deal. So the back of it has the old school eighties giants. Uh, this is San Francisco giants logo, uh, in script, you know, in the writing and everything else, big block letters. Um, but this is like the warmest jacket that you could possibly wear to candlestick park. Mm. I bought it. I, I it probably cost me an entire paycheck. I think it was like $110. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it cost me an entire paycheck one one time. Uh, we also got a discount at sports stuff. So I bought it. Um, and it's got a, a zip up the side, too. So when it gets really hot or you're wearing something underneath it, you can unzip the side up a little bit and just kind of let it out. Or if you have too many Polish dogs at Candlestick Park, like <laughs> I used to. Um, but that is something that I would love to. Uh, other Giants fans to have an experience. I think that's a great gift. Um, you probably could even find those still on eBay, uh, the San Francisco Giants parka from the 80s. I want to say that was probably 89 that I worked at Sports Stuff. So that's a 1989 jacket. I used to get a kick out of the parka because it was never really that cold enough in the Bay area to like have no. a, a jacket. Uh, Unless you went to candlestick, right? That's the Unless only time. The, and so that's why I bought it. Cause we were going to so many giants games. I got my license. Uh, I used to drive up one one hit the giants games. We'd go two eighty if we wanted to cruise and take our time and not have to worry about traffic and stuff. Um, you know, jam a little crisscross or whatever. You know, on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what kind of employee were you at sports stuff? Like, let's say someone's in, in the store again, yeah. we're, we're during the Christmas season and they're kind of searching around and you can kind of tell they're like, not sure exactly. Are you, were you the type of uh, customer service person to go up to them and just be like, Hey, can I help you with anything? You know, what, what kind of thing are you looking for? Or were you just kind of like, you know what? If they ask me questions, I will answer, but I'm not going to be out there on the floor. See now. Okay. So it was a very small store. And at the front, we had a TV that we could keep on ESPN. Mm. And, and I didn't have cable at the time. So I spent a lot of time watching <laughs> ESPN. I was like, this is great. Cause I, I don't have it, but I would, when people would go in there, I would always kind of give them like, three minutes or so, four mm-hmm. minutes to kind of browse around. And uh, a lot of times people would get what they want, bring it right up. We had the the hat wall with all the old school hats. I still have some of the old school, like Texas Rangers hats with the big block T. Um, I think I have a Montreal Expos hat as well. Uh, a lot of, a lot of hats that I bought during that time. Then I was like, Oh, these are great hats. You know, I love baseball. Um, but yeah, I'd go up and I, I would help people, you know, wh- who's your favorite team? Who's your son's favorite team, daughter's favorite team, whatever. Let me help you find something that they would, that they would like. So, um, I was, all, I was all, always into that. Not as much as the music store though. I worked in a music store for about 10 years in Santa Clara music plus. And then if you remember that on Stevens Creek, that one, I would go searching around to people cause I would just sit and talk music all day with them. What are you looking for? We would put on a record or an album CD, whatever you want to call it. We would put on a CD and then we would make bets of how, okay, I'm going to put on this Clapton CD just came out. How many do you think I can sell while this is playing? And then we'd, we'd do like an over under of like three copies of it. You know, it's like an hour long album. Yeah. And, and I would always pick ones that would sell like two or three people come up and go, who is this? I, I'd like to buy that. So yeah, that, that's where I really shine the music store. See Clapton's record labels should have been paying you guys for 
that great service there. Well, they they would they would come in and we would get the promos. So we okay. would get the free CDs from them. So we would get the promos with the drilled out holes in them, um, and and they you know Warner rep would drop them off and and we'd open the box and be like, oh Clapton, okay, who wants this? And you put your name on it. So when you're done playing it and the album would be released, they we would always get them like a week or two before they came out. Yeah. Then the album would be released and then we got to take it home. So it was like, I had so much free music from there. I have like 700 CDs and I probably paid for like 200 of them. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) All right. So the second thing that you would give away from your own collection is this bad boy here. Now (laughs) that the the photo didn't come out great, (laughs) Um, but this is, was this after 87? This okay, so this, I actually have it with me right here too. I brought it. I brought it with me. October sixteenth, nineteen eighty-seven. Here's okay. a little bit closer look at it. Yes. If you're uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see all the good stuff there. Um, this was right before the playoffs in nineteen eighty-seven. The Giants was it uh, before? Or after it was it before? No, it was huh? before. Yeah, the Giants won the West, and they were going into it, so they were hyping it, and then we kept having all these. I mean, this was like a dream come true for me because yes. the Giants had never been to the playoffs in my lifetime. Right, and so this was, uh, uh, you know, just a really cool thing that the Mercury News did. I have four of these. And so that's why I thought it'd be a really good gift because I thought this is cool. Yeah. Something you could frame yeah. for a Giants fan and they would freak out um, on the inside too, on the backside. So they're baseball cards. Yeah. So you were supposed to like cut them out. I don't think I ever did that. But on the back, it would, you know, it's their baseball card. It would only have their 1987 regular season stats on it. Uh, Mercury News. They didn't go crazy with it. Um, but it, but it was really cool. I had the whole 1987 Giants team on here. I uh, got you super pumped. I love the picture of, can you see Rick Rushel on yeah, there? Yeah. Uh, where he's looking. Look, yeah. yeah. He's looking, <laughs> just looking goofy as hell. I, uh, I don't know who did the art. Oh, Jim Hummel. Looks like he did the artwork on these. Um but yeah, it, it was a, it's a really fun thing. I have a lot of these. And then I have a third thing just for kicks. Oh, yes. There it is. Will's oh, yes. World. If you remember that, that was at Giants Magazine when you went to Candlestick Park. Uh, there was a guy outside always selling. Uh, is Giants that Corey Magazine. Snyder? Who is that? Corey Snyder and Will Clark. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, July 1992. So it would be an entire month. Um, had scorecards in it. Uh, all kinds of cool stuff. I even have a, oh, here's a, you know, 10% off of the Giants dugout store, nine bucks off an adult starter Giants pro jacket, nine wow. bucks off right there. There you go. Um, yeah. And then it had, uh, you know, so this, this one actually had a set of baseball cards in it, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. So, um, yeah, so this this is the type of stuff that as a Giants fan, I would freak out if I opened up, even I don't care how old it is. Yeah. If I opened this up, I was I I would go crazy. I mean, just even for the ads, for the ads from 1992 in here, are just fantastic. But there's a nice little, you know, write up on Roger Craig and how he deals with, uh, you know, the uh, losses in 87 and 89 and how he's dealing with it in 92. Well, as we know, that was his last year. Yeah, last year. Um, 93 not dealing with it great he did not but they had a nice write-up <laughs> in july of 1992 for roger craig so nothing in there about the team possibly going to tampa yeah, bay huh? i don't think so <laughs> no i don't think so <laughs> no but that so that's how i interpreted it when you yes. brought this up yes. i was like oh well uh, i have all kinds of cool stuff that i would give other giants fans so, yeah. all right all right so <laughs> I uh, I selected three things that I okay. could you could find out on the internet. I think this first thing most current giant fa- Giants fans would have, which is the mm. Band of Misfits, which is the An- Andrew Baggerly book on the 2010 yeah. Giants. What I didn't realize is he released another book in 2015 um, about both the pre-2010 teams and the obviously the the post-2010 championship team so i think i'm gonna pick that up at some point before next year's uh, baseball season so be interesting to see the stories because he's covering bonds and and all that stuff in there as well but that you 
Oh, I was just going to ask, do you have the physical version of that book, The Band of Misfits? You know, I did, but when I moved from Gilroy back up north to San Jose, I basically gave every physical book and DVD to the local library. Yeah. I just gave it all away. I was like, you know what? I I don't, I don't have anywhere to put it anyways <laughs> right now. So, um my yeah. my wife would love if I did that, I have so many CDs, but I put them in, I put them in those books now. Yeah, like I yeah, just yeah, talked yeah. about, I have 700 CDs. I put them in those books and then put the cases in boxes and those are up in the garage. So I at least just have the CDs in books, but I do have the Kindle version of, um, band of Misfits. is band of misfits, right? Yes. That's yes. The title. I have that Kindle. I, I still have not read it. And here we are 11 years later. It's re- it's really good. It's yeah. an ex- it's ex- he's a, he's a good writer. All right, next thing, and this isn't really licensed giants stuff here. <laughs> so this is a shirt, and, and for the people who are listening on the podcast, it is somebody. It's sort of like an et- Etsy made shirt. Yeah, where uh, it's a photo of a guy, and it says "Meet Dick," and it says Dick is a Dodgers fan, and then on the back of the shirt, it says. <laughs> Don't be a dick. <laughs> so, you know, we, we love that Giants Dodgers rivalry yes. for that Giants fan in your life. You want to be a little crude. You want to walk around uh, Oracle w- with a shirt that says don't be a dick and <laughs> meaning don't be a Dodgers fan. So I do. I do want that shirt now. <laughs> I, I do want that shirt. I think that's a fantastic shirt. <laughs> All right. Last one here. And uh, so I, I saw that one on Amazon. So this one yeah. is, is at the Giants store, the Giants fanatic store. And you and I had mentioned this before. And, and when we sent it to my son, my son was like, ah, the V-neck. I can't hand you can't handle the V-neck. But this is the <laughs> style, right? This is the 70s sort of Giants logo. You see the the ball with the Giants in the cursive writing, like that's, that's how that that's old school. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so it's like an orange pullover jersey uh, from the late seventies with the the piping of the black and the white and the black stripes. This is so when I was a kid, um, for as long as I can remember, and I, you know, I'm sure once I don't maybe even when I was. Almost, you know, still a teenager living at my parents' house. This was still up, but there was <clears throat> Major League Baseball wallpaper on my walls. And you know, back when we were younger, wallpaper was kind of the thing. Like they had like wallpaper stores and stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And if, you know, every room had like a different wallpaper, and you just glue <laughs> the wallpaper on the wall. Now you just paint the walls and and stuff. Yeah. But back then, so I had this uh, baseball, Major League Baseball wallpaper. And by the time I sort of got into baseball, all the logos had changed already. So yeah. it was like this Giants logo had already changed um, to the, you know, the I guess you would say the more recent um, script, the, the more recent font. And so I always, I was always so crazy about that that logo that the Giants had, and um, anything I can find with that old seventies, early eighties logo, I, I just kind of snatch up as, as much as possible so I, I i am if i can find that jersey somewhere i think i'm gonna buy it i i absolutely would i mean that is a super cool jersey and yeah brian did did say what that's bad guy <laughs> like the v-neck is bad guy yeah that, that's a, a wrestling reference i assume that's <laughs> like you know if you're wearing a v-neck you're you're one of the bad guys well right? actually the, the reference is because his grandfather so my my father-in-law <laughs> Um, he, uh, he, he doesn't speak great English, but he very much tries. Yeah. And so when my kids were small, he would always ask them, he would say, you know, are you being a good guy? Meaning, are you being good for your parents? And he'd be, are you being a good guy or are you being a bad guy? And so then (laughs) my kids, you know, they, they would always goof, goof off and they would go, oh, I'm a, I'm a good guy or, oh, I'm a bad guy. So I would always like kind of joke around with them as they were growing up and just say the same thing or you've been a good guy or you've been a bad guy so now that's that's just what we call oh, each other we, we either call each other good guy or bad guy i love that that is great <laughs> <laughs> so v-neck is bad guy yeah v-neck, you're being a bad guy, <laughs> <a> bad guy. <laughs> 
All right. Oh, um, <laughs> you know, we did it again. We went over an hour when we yeah. Did, yeah hey, well, let's talk. We're about gonna it. do a short show tonight. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly what we said. Um, so Brad's gonna go back and eat eat some more dinner. I gotta, I gotta get. I think my wife is on uh, Daddy's Home Two. We're in the stretch Ooh. run of the Christmas movies. Nice. She, when I told her, I said, you know, we started watching Daddy's Home Two yesterday. And it's Christmas themed, and so it fits. And then I was like, "Okay, I got to do this podcast. What are you going to watch right now?" She's like, "The Santa Claus." And I'm like, "Wait, but the kids aren't here. Like, it's a kids movie." She's like, "No, I'm watching the Santa Claus. I like this movie." So she's on the Christmas movie kick all of nice. December, pretty much. We've been she's been digging into the Christmas movies. So yeah, we're kind of we're kind of working on some like holiday baking championship we like that type of stuff um you know it's finals week for the 15 year old so there's not a whole lot of movie and show watching this week that's a little bit insane but well i think we'll pick it up this weekend we'll, we'll start going crazy this weekend so yeah all right so uh yeah that's it from here so for brad i'm double g we'll see you when we see you peace out peace <laughs>